In our fast paced world, it's easy to get swept up in the currents that surround us, but we are the authors of our own life story and we are infinitely capable of creating the change we want to see within us and beyond. Welcome to Shaping Freedom, a show where we explore and share practical ways to cultivate extraordinary life experiences. I'm your host, Lisanne Basquiat. I'm a teacher, entrepreneur, and life strategist. After a career as a corporate executive, I embarked on my own path of entrepreneurship and focused on the human and spirit connection. I come from generations of trailblazing entrepreneurs, artists, healers, and champions of human dignity. This week, I'm joined by Oliver Chittenden, the founder of Head Talks, a site that gathers hundreds of educational and inspirational stories about the different ways people care for their mental and emotional well being. This site has been dubbed TED Talks for the Mind. Today, with Oliver, we're talking about how to build the toolbox for your mental and emotional health. We're all unique individuals with different needs, and one size fits all solutions just don't work for everyone. And even as the stigma surrounding mental health melts away, we need to learn more about ourselves so we can better recognize our own struggles, recoveries, and successes. We'll talk a little bit about Oliver's journey to self-discovery and how he hopes to help people everywhere get to know themselves better and find the tools that work best for them. If hearing new perspectives on finding a healthy balance for your mental health is as exciting to you as it is for me, I think you'll love listening to my conversation with Oliver Chittenden. Good morning, Oliver. I'm so happy that we're having this conversation, that we're getting ready to have this conversation. Quite frankly, I've uh, we've been orbiting for quite some time and uh, it's taken a bit for us to get to having this conversation. And um, I knew about Head Talks before we encountered each other and was just really excited that you kind of popped in and we started talking about something for the London Speakers Bureau, uh, which I was very happy about and grateful for but even more happy that we uh, were able to have any kind of conversation around this here topic that we're going to chat about this morning. Uh, So welcome. Thank you very much. And um, good afternoon from here in England, where it's about five o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm in the countryside about two hours from London. And I have been preparing with an eye pouch which is a heavy pouch that i put over my eyes and a very heavy rug on my bed and the reason is those are two tips to start our conversation for your listeners is um my brain doesn't work very well in the afternoon i i i it works much better in the morning so i've been preparing for my interview lisan with with an eye pouch and um, a heavy rug, both of which help my general nerves and brain power. So that's the scene, my end. I love this. So this uh, podcast and each conversation aims to answer a very specific question to help guide the audience around what it is that we're going to talk about. And I, I think that a good question that we can talk about and kind of put into the space of our conversation is how do you create your own toolbox for your own mental and emotional health? I'd love to, you know, go through a little bit of your journey and how you got to the place that you're at uh, and how you got to a place professionally where you've created this incredible space for people who are seeking answers to uh, the quality of their own mental health, but also how you got to a place personally where you are addressing your unique needs through having a heavy rug, a weighted rug on you and uh, uh, something over your eyes and knowing the time of day that is best for you. So how does that question feel to you? Like, how do you, by the end of this conversation, I would love to offer some 
tips and gems to people around how they create their own toolbox. Absolutely, I get it. And um, yeah, it feels quite overwhelming to sort of think about telling my entire journey. And I'm not, not going to be able to do that, I don't think, without sort of dribbling dribbling down the phone and, and uh, my jaw sort of wobbling around. Um, but I'll do my best. I mean, the first thing I'll say, I'm 47 years old now. And so it has been a journey. Um, and what I want to say is different things affect you at different times in your life, I've found, when it comes to mental health. Um, and currently in my life, um, I have two children, little children, and I'm married and I'm having to work quite hard to send our children to, to schools because we have this weird private school system in England. And so the things I'm facing at the moment are very different to the ones I was facing 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I guess the reason I say that is, is, is because mental health is a very hard space to navigate. It's something I've realized. I mean, we all know what mental health is now. And the idea of stigma has been, has been, um, not dealt with completely by any means, but has definitely been addressed in a lot of societies and communities. I mean, the, the stigma, interestingly, is worse in, in the corporate space still. Still a huge distance to go there. Um, but we are talking, even in England, where we're sort of, you know, um, you know, we're used to a stiff upper lip mentality after the war, you know, um, we're talking about it all very openly. And it's the, the media, I mean, there's a newspaper every day has a different story about mental health. So that's a really great thing. But coming up with your own sort of toolbox, um, come, is 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 a challenge that everyone has to go on and i i believe that you know that whether you're feeling good bad ugly um you know whatever it is you're feeling um or how you think you are in life i i think the fact that we've proved that the mind and the body are linked that we should all try things that um, make us have a better experience in this thing we call life. Um, and so I think even if you think you're, you know, you're well and you're, you know, you're, you're cruising and life seems great. I, th I, I still think there's a mental health journey to go on. And obviously if you're not feeling well, then, you know, there's, there's even more to do. And the, 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 the challenge is what is it that's going to work for you? Um, I mean, we know that from, you know, mental health, services public services in, in england and i think probably in the us that you know the standard cbt therapy and medication you know it just doesn't work for everyone you know this isn't a space where a one size fits all approach you know we're all very complex we all have a different makeup and you know one thing might not work for that person but it will work for that other person just as the symptoms of depression or, or anxiety or grief, you know, it's really, you know, peer to peer uh, healing is extremely valuable. And I think underrated because not because that person has the same symptoms as you, but that person can relate to the pain that you're going through. And, and there's a lot of healing in that peer to peer, but the symptoms are never exactly the same, just as the recovery is never exactly the same. Um, and this is what makes this space so hard to navigate. So I think for me, it was always a case of the reason I created Head Talks was to create a space, a, a, a digital platform, if you like, where you could pull all the resources together. When I say resources, not necessarily resources, but ideas, sort of educational ideas that you can practically try yourself and try the, if you're inspired by watching a video, there is, you know, Wim Hof, the Iceman jumping, you know, in ice water in the Antarctic for two minutes or singing in the local choir or, 
you know, going on a silent meditation retreat or joining a gardening group or, you know, laughter therapy, pet therapy, you know, there's so many things that we can do that we don't know affect can, can help us. Um, you know, you look at Japan who famously have integrated within their health system, walking and bathing in woods. Um, that's part of their health system, um, social, social system. Um, and there are, you know, Georgia is famous for dancing. I found this out because I did a, um, it was a, um, a salsa video for women kind of in their fifties and sixties whose confidence was waning. And they joined a salsa group, um, with these Georgia dancers. And, um, it was a way of just rediscovering their femininity and their confidence because you're with someone, you know, learning to dance, you're close to someone. Um, and it was amazing talking to these, these, um, these women, you know, after, after a class. And so I went on this crusade, if you like, of trying to find all these things and bringing them to this platform in the form of interviews, i.e. to camera, but also podcasts and masterclasses, um, and blogs, um, and a really diverse bunch of people. And I was telling my wife yesterday, I think we've done, well, I've, I've, I think it was 252 interviews wow. to camera. Um, and that's, that's not the podcast. So I, I guess we're probably between 350 to 500. And that's an eight year journey where every week we've aimed to put one, publish one piece of content per week. We've slimmed since COVID, that's been slimmed down to two weeks to serve our community and do whatever it can out there in the, in the stratosphere of internet, um, and whatever cyber space people connect on. Um, so that's, that's kind of the premise of the, the head talk journey, if you like. And, um, and yes, it was born out of my own, um, mental breakdown, which I won't go into huge detail. Um, but essentially, um, I was 27 years old. I'm 47 now. Um, and I was in Brussels, Belgium, and I was on a trajectory to high corporate success. I was in and around, um, very, you know, um, senior people at NATO and the European Commission. Um, and then I just got struck out the blue, no warning, nothing. And back then, you know, you didn't have the language, the skills, the, you know, this, the, you, you know, you just didn't, I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. I couldn't believe this was happening. I was full of shame. So I, anyway, I went on this crazy, what I call my year on the run. In the end, I ended up getting picked off a, a pavement in Sydney and shipped back to a rehab. And since then, you know, it's been a journey, you know, I've had to re, 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 um, rejig things to allow for the fact that depression and anxiety exist in my life. And, um, it's, it's often a, a concept that people miss is that, you know, of sadly depression and anxiety and mental ill health often comes back. You know, people think it just comes and goes and, and environmentally it can, you know, the death of some, uh, a close relative or going bankrupt or environmentally something can happen and you can just fall into a hole and slowly dig yourself out. But, um, a, a sort of misconcept, if you like, or what people don't often say is that annoyingly it's something you often have to live with for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think, um, uh, it's interesting as you were talking about the corp, you know, corporate mental health and that you were in a space of on this trajectory of your own career uh, at 27 or 26. I, uh, I remembered the first time that I ever encountered a blip in my own emotional and mental health. And, uh, I'm typically, uh, a, a pretty happy person for the most part. I do really, really well at um, just getting on with things, you know, pulling myself up by my bootstraps. I, I come from a family of uh, a first generation, you know, I'm first generation. And in my family, uh, as a child, there wasn't a lot of language, as you said, for anything 
other than or for emotions that were outside of um just joy <laughs> or hard work and just getting on with things making things happen and uh uh emotion negative emotion sadness hurt those were seen as a weakness and i also came up in a family where my mother my own mother uh, struggled with mental health and as I was listening to a Google talk that you did, it reminded me, or it kind of put two dots together, which were that I believe that at some point in my own journey, I may have made a decision that I was not going to allow myself to overtly experience any negative emotion because that would be weakness and perhaps that would send me into the, um, a direction or send me down to a place with my own mental health that I didn't want to be. And so I, I'm still kind of processing that because I just re-watched that this morning, but I was working and I was going through several issues in my own life. Several things were happening. My, my marriage was falling apart. I had a death that I was experiencing and out of nowhere in the middle of my corporate career, I felt myself starting to um, kind of fall apart <laughs> a bit where I felt sadness and I felt sadness while I was in the middle of my workday, which was something that had, I had never allowed to happen before. And um, I was in an environment where I was very well respected and had really great working relationships, but and I was experiencing this kind of emotional undoing. And I remember speaking to a leader that I respected very, very much and really looked up to and saw as a bit of a mentor. I remember going into his office and sitting down to talk to him and feeling just like I wanted to say something. I wanted to explain some of what was happening in my life outside of how I showed up in emails and in the conference room and, and all of this. And it was not a great conversation because it was one of those moments where I realized that humanity, there was no place for humanity in the corporate space. There was no place for uh, whatever it was that I was feeling or whatever was happening outside of my workday in the, uh, in the corporate space. And that even though there was a lot of talk, uh, and programming, uh, that was starting to happen around employee help or employee health, it hadn't fully integrated into how we were experiencing each other on a day to day basis. I've since learned. Uh, you know, this past weekend, I myself uh, shut myself down and, you know, I was tired. I, I do a lot of different things, as I can imagine. You probably uh, experienced some of that because you have, you know, the London Speakers Bureau, you have head talks, and uh, I would imagine that there are times where you are putting so much out, you need a moment to connect with yourself, which is what I felt this weekend, uh, where I, mid-exchange, stopped speaking to people over text, like in the middle of conversation. I just knew that it wasn't that I needed to be alone. Uh, and that's what I gave myself and gifted myself. Um, and I'm much more comfortable doing that today than um, that I was, you know, 20 years ago uh, when that experience happened, 15 years ago when that experience happened. In terms of uh, head talks, what would you say is the uh, is the thing that is up for most people? What is uh, is it anxiety? Is it depression? Or what is the thing that's getting to most people who you're speaking with on head talks? It's a really good question, actually. Um, yeah. Um... I think, I think, hmm, that's a very good question. It really is, because it's hard, because I've interviewed such a, a wide variety of people. Um, I mean, when I, when I give an interview, actually, I've always 
try to I, I never prepare. <laughs> I I um I like to sort of um fly by the seat of my pants a little bit and and um I have a li- I have a tiny little book from uh I picked up it's some sort of Him- Himalayan um uh art on it and I just scribble down some sort of question but I generally broke it down into the journey, the start, where it went wrong and and, and sort of most importantly you know how it got better um and, and what i found actually is even if you even if i was interviewing you know spiritual healers or you know people you know former ceos of you know of you know seriously large companies or olympic heroes or you know people real achievers because there's actually a section of of um you know success and failure um because I wanted to show people that you know it's we all have mental health. What I notice is you know I um, everyone everyone has been through a period of their lives um, which has been challenging, and and I think I think you know we're geared up towards um, you know having this sort of you know this vision this vision of a happy life. I mean it's like what is what is that you know who's telling us that it's 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 unrealistic you know there are going to be times in life which are going to be challenges and 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 you know there's going to be unhappiness you know i mean we're all going to lose someone we love you know that is a fact um so i don't know if that's answered your question but i think you know i remember in, in, interviewing this this sports psychologist who who trained with um the top golfers you know and I remember finding out that this guy had a period of his life where he was homeless and I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is like someone who teaches, um, you know, the top golfers in the world and he's a very successful sports psychologist. And, um, you know, it was really, it was like, I was, I was so pleased that he shared that with me. And, and there was another time now I'm thinking about it, a famous jockey, a, a horsing, a horse jockey who told me went through a really difficult period where he, you know, he had alcohol problems and he picked up the phone and he couldn't believe how kind the people at the end of the phone at AA were and he couldn't believe it existed out there. And he, he's now doing really well and everything. But these were things that popped out in interviews. So I think, I think that's it. It's like, you know, we're all going to be challenged. There, there are good times to be had, of course. But, um, yeah, I think, um, we, you know, however they manifest themselves, we're we're gonna. We're, it's not all going to be smooth sailing. You know, it's just not. Yeah, I think I think what's also what's hap- what's changing today is that people want to hear about reality. Yeah, what's really going on, and not necessarily so that we can all be in a big, you know, um, depressive, you know thing with each other but so that we understand that it's okay that we're human beings and i think so much at least in this country so much of what is portrayed is this idea that we just hop up every day and we look you know men are well coiffed and pulled together and you know and women are the same and we just kind of walk around and you're not supposed to let things bother you and you're and i'm saying supposed to understanding that that is i think very silly and um unrealistic uh um and i think that it is really while it's uncomfortable because there are so many people who are talking about depression and anxiety and you know the you know these uh more negative emotions I don't think that it's new. I think that it's just that we're now becoming more and more comfortable talking about it. And so there's this discomfort because it's like, whoa, wait a minute. (laughs) You know, we're talking about anger and, you know, people are sad and hurt and, and, uh, and just like not wanting to be bothered with, with things. Uh, but I think that we are on our way to a more authentic life experience with each other. And that's a wonderful thing, you know, if we can just take all of that out of the way and really connect with and um, uh, speak with each other 
and be able to be able to support each other because we're speaking a language that truly is based in in love and in understanding and acceptance and just being able to be with each other yeah no i I hear you and i think you know that language is going to come through from the next generation and it's changing in the workplace you know i mean you know it's having to change in the workplace because the human capacity could only take too much you know so Mm. you know these things are are changing slowly um and you know the next generation you know they're not going to be going to the traditional banks and accountancy firms, you know, the brightest people will go to the, the, the companies that are ticking all the boxes ethically, you know, who have purpose, who have, you know, who, and who are doing good in the world. And I think we need to hide, we need to focus on those stories more. I mean, I'm, I, w- I don't want to say that Head Talks is all about sort of negative mental health, whatever that means. Um, you know, it's 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 just a normal conversation. You know, it's being honest, brutally honest, and um, you know, enjoying things um, that you know. If you're going to have the best experiences and the best memories and the best relationships, you know, you want to be on the best form. You know, if you can if you can add ten or twenty percent to your life, you know, why wouldn't you give that a go? You know, and I, and and I guess you know that's where I'm coming to, coming at it from. Um, And yeah, I think the language is changing. I think, you know, I think, you know, it is, it's great. I think positive psychology works. I really do. You know, I think surrounding yourself with, with positive things is, is a very good thing. Um, but there's still some distance to go. Um, and I think, you know, as a, as a huge, as a species, you know, we are in the habit of sort of, um, destroying things and, and uh, each other and it's easy to sort of lose lose hope um that's the game right <laughs> yeah but it's like you know it's like um i mean it goes back to what we were saying about different times in your life you know like i've reached you know i'm like i said i'm 47 now and you know i the two game changers that have happened in the last five months for me or, or five years sorry have been you know a real connection spiritually and and what that is and what that looks like, I'm not going to bore you with because actually people can be spiritual balls, I've learned. Um, and I don't think that's a very cool thing to be. Um, but, you know, I think that sense of being connected to something bigger than yourself, I think, you know, as relig- – I mean, this may be slightly dangerous to say, but, you know, religions are on, you know, massive downward trajectory um, in terms of attendance in churches and things like that. And I think the young are connecting much more to nature, to the planet, and to something sort of source, you know, that that, that comes from that. And I think that's can have a huge impact on on your on one's happiness. I've always been convinced that, you know, in the olden days when the Greeks had their gods and the Romans and, you know, there was always this this higher power. And I actually think they were happier as a result. I mean, they still fought wars and killed each other and and all of that, but you know. To have that something that's above your own chaos in your mind is is huge, and and actually, what led me to that was meditation. Was really going into meditation in in a deep way, and um, that having that accessibility um, really was transformational for for me personally, and and it's something that is an integral part of my life now and keeping me stable. Uh, I'm sorry I went off on on one on that one, but um, I don't quite know how I got to that point. But essentially, um, I, I think you know the language I want to say is is changing towards one of purpose, to one of respect, spirituality, perhaps um, you know uh, sustainability, and all these things. And and you know the louder that drum can be play but you know the happier we'll all be i guess and um yeah for me it was just stopping and i i do meditate and for me um there was this time when i realized and it was shortly after that one experience and i've had a couple since then um but for me it was to just stop just stop. And it didn't mean blowing my whole life up or any of that, but just to stop because we move so quickly and there's so much going on and there's so much 
information that we're processing every nanosecond of our lives. And what I've learned, and I guess part of my toolkit um, that I'm cultivating is to stop, to know when to stop. Yeah. Um, and for some that feels like such a, like, I, if you stop, it all falls apart. And what I've learned uh, is that when I stop, I'm giving my, myself a moment to ensure that I'm in alignment with myself and that I'm connected with myself because otherwise my head is running out ahead of every other part of me. And that's not a good place. I can do it for a minute because I'm really, I can multitask and I have a lot of, you know, I, I can get a lot of things done. I'm very productive. Um, and I have become very, very comfortable with stopping and checking in along the way and ensuring that I am, that I have my own toolkit, which is meditation and rest when I need it. And, uh, not talking when I don't want to talk or when I really need to have the co the conversation I need to have is one with myself. Um, and the, the really simple things, the getting back to basic things like drinking water or <laughs> telling the truth about how I'm really feeling and, and what's really up for me. Uh, I think that those things are I think sometimes we're looking for like this big, huge moment of something. And one of the ways that we can feel better on a day-to-day -day basis is to listen to ourselves, you know, because we really do know what's best for us. We really do know what we, uh, what we need. And I think sometimes just listening to ourselves and, and, and allowing our own voice a moment in our day can do so much more than pushing yourself for that, like that one last meeting or those 25 <laughs> extra emails or, you know, whatever it is that's going on. Um, yeah, there's no question that the speed of life has become hugely challenging for the human brain um, yeah. when you think about it's evolution you know from when we were coming down from the trees and you know we're sort of caveman and or, and women you know it's like and now we're sort of glued to you know laptops and phones and things like that and i often think god this is just we, you know were our brains actually designed or you know are they is it possible for them to in, you know ingest this all this information at such a rapid rate so I think, yeah, I think, you know, I think schools definitely need to teach kids about stopping and, um, you know, and about how the human mind works and the, the need to, to look after your mind like you would your body. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we'd be far better equipped, I think, learning about emotions, about meditation at school and about, you know, all these things. I think, you know, educationally, is such a good place to start. Um, I mean, I go into my, my girls' schools and do meditation for kids aged three, four, or five, and I'm amazed at how receptive they are. And the teachers all say, apart from also joining in and loving it, that afterwards they're on such good form in the next class. Uh, Absolutely. And it's amazing the questions they ask and you know, it's, it's just fantastic. And I, I think even if it's just ringing a bell, you know, an old fashioned bell for two minutes quiet time, you know, at the start of the day or something like that is a really good message to the young, you know, to the young, um, just to get that through so that they can develop their own ways of having that pause later on in life. Because we're programming ourselves every day and we're programming those that we're around every day. And I, I really, I have a five-year-old granddaughter and um, I know that her experience because of the times that I've been willing to just fall apart <laughs> and figure out how to put myself back together, um, I know that she will have a different experience because of that. Um, I think that, you know, there is a safety that is not just about our physical safety. You know, we have a mental body, an emotional body, a spiritual and a physical one. And 
I think that there's, you know, we, we talk a lot about safety from the perspective of physical safety or even the safety with other people. Uh, but I think that finding a way to be safe or to feel safe within our own being is really important. And I'm really excited that, you know, my five-year-old granddaughter and my 16-year-old grandson, that they are learning how important it is to care for themselves. And I think that we miss that. I think that, um, at least in my experience, a lot of the language that was spoken to me was about doing for other people, which is wonderful. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to be of service. I live a lot of my life in service to other people, and it's really important to make sure that you're in service to yourself and that you are caring for yourself. And if that means just stepping away and sitting down for a few minutes and meditating or journaling and having that be not a thing that you do when you can't take another moment of your life, but something that you're integrating into your day-to-day -day life, it makes you, like you mentioned, more receptive to what's happening around you and more awake and, and, and clear so that you can better process the information that is coming in and swirling around us. That's right. And it's, it's, you're, you're kind of working or talking about prevention there, you know, preventative approach, because, you know, just like the heart can go wrong or the liver can go wrong or a knee needs replacing, you know, the brain can malfunction. And it's not because you've got a, you know, a problem with yourself. It, it can malfunction just through external factors. So, you know, so knowing that you can fall back on these things is a preventative approach. Um, that should serve humanity, you know, well, I, you know. And it's overuse. <laughs> Sometimes it's just, you know, I, I went, oh, I uh, took a few days off a couple of weeks ago because I have been working almost nonstop for a ridiculously long time, uh, longer than I would normally. Uh, and it was at the time those decisions were made because there's a lot to do and this has to happen. And there's these big projects that we're working on and, and all of that. And I got to a place last year, toward the end of last year, where I was grumpy. I was grumpy with other people. I was tired. I was angry. Um, and it was for very small things that I would typically not, um, feel that way about. And I had that moment of like, okay, you've done enough, Lisan. It is time for you to shut it down, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and go and take care of yourself. And I was very happy that I did that. And it kind of reset where I was so that I could then make my decisions a little bit clearer. I think that we, you know, we have, you know, our car runs out of gas and we know that you have to fill it or you're going nowhere. Uh, we are the same way. There comes a point where we are out of gas. And for many of us, you know, we attempt to continue, you know, to get this car that is our being to continue moving. And it's just uh, not realistic and uh, never going to happen. And, uh, and that's kind of how we start to shut down. I love a good break. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, Head Talk, how, um, and I think I miss, is it Head Talks or Head Talk? Please forgive me. It don't worry, it's headtalks.com. That's what I thought. Okay. People have dubbed it the TED Talks of the mind, but it's nowhere near as successful as TED Talks. <laughs> well, I think that um, more people, um, my hope is that people will uh, dive in there. It is a, uh, it has a plethora of information. And like you said, it's not the resources uh, that people might think about, but it's really the resource of the ability to connect with other humans through their story and to find a piece of yourself in the stories that other people are sharing. And so I see Head Talk as a, um, as a bit of a, a community a community of people who have the courage and the bravery to share their story, their journey with others. Um, and again, I heard about it before ever, um, you know, speaking with you uh, directly. And 
I was thrilled uh, that it existed. And uh, I commend you and uh, thank you for creating a space for people to connect. So I think that that's what so many people are looking for today is connection. And when you are not in a space to be able to do so with a person, it's great to have a place where you can go to, um, to do that on your own, to find your own answers and to come up with your own, uh, ways of being that work and that are resonant with your own experience and what you want and need. That's it. I couldn't have put it better. Um, Oliver, thank you so much for chatting with me during the time of day that you don't like to. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. I love how technology helps us to, um, to connect through time zones. I'm in, uh, on the West coast, so I'm in Pacific, uh, time zone. And I, uh, uh, believe that you're in France. Is I know it? I'm in England. You're in the UK. You said that in the beginning. At your time this morning, I was I was getting into a, a lake which was six degrees. Oh, <laughs> with a with a friend of mine uh, swimming around it, and uh, yeah, luckily there was a life a lifeguard. I've done cryotherapy and, and, you know, I've gotten into cold things, but I've not done it to, uh, the extreme of, you know, the, uh, uh, that thing that people do where they go in the polar thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's incredibly invigorating. Like every time that I've done it after it's been scary to do it, uh, because my mind tells me like, don't do this. It's not the right thing. It's not comfy cozy. But afterwards I have such a rush of just, mm. just energy yeah. and it feels so good. Yeah, that's good. It makes yeah. you feel alive, which is kind of a, yeah. a word I really like at the moment. I'm almost replacing the word happy with feeling alive, I think, is uh, it's something I, yes. I seek out wherever I can. Yes. Oliver, thank you so much again for joining me. Pleasure. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. Yeah. And um, if you want to know more about Oliver's story, please look it up. I'm so glad that you didn't you know, I didn't want you to have to tell the entire story. You've told it. Uh, and so uh, if you want to know more about Oliver's journey and what he's, how he's gotten to where he is today, um, look him up. Uh, there's a this amazing Google talk that he did and, uh, and many others. And uh, be sure to go to Head Talks and uh, learn more about what's going on there. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. If you're feeling inspired by our conversation to check out the website Head Talks, please do. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. I know that you'll find something inspiring and uplifting there in that community. So what's in your toolbox for your own mental and emotional well-being? Are you ready to add something new like salsa dancing or forest bathing? And remember, keep trying things until you find what brings you joy and clarity. Find your community and trust yourself. Thank you for listening. <music>